gadgets. So we're kind of getting used to these, but I think these will help our folks that are watching online because we're now able to get the sound back to the recording. So if you happen to miss, hopefully you'll have a better experience watching. These are posted to YouTube, and then we're also posting these on Facebook. So if you ever miss, you can catch up. Um, I miss seeing you all last week. I had a nice trip with my family. Um, Father is still uh, gone, and we have another guest speaker this evening. This is Mr. Alex Harb. He is our high school religion teacher at Sacred Heart School. And our topic tonight is the creed, the Nicene Creed. And so he's going to get us started with the conversation. And um, if you have any questions, let us know. And um, enjoy. All right. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Since I'm so far away from everybody, I'm going to take this off uh, so that you can see who's teaching you. <clears throat> oh, we can start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, so today, um, during work, I was asked uh, if I could teach about the creed. Um, and at first I sat, I, I, I was pretty sure I was going to do it, but first I sat because I just wanted to see what Kim's face would be like if I told her that it might not be able to happen. But um, I'm happy to be here. So if you look at, at the sheet, the handout, uh, you have in front of you the Nicene Creed. This is the creed that you're probably used to saying uh, at Mass on Sundays. And uh, if you see, if you have it in any, does everybody have the English one? Does anybody have the Spanish one? Okay. If you're looking at it, you notice that it's divided into four paragraphs. So what I'd like to do tonight is to go through each paragraph with you and explain the meaning. Uh, so that the next time you go to Mass on Sunday, you'll have a better understanding of what you're saying when you, when you recite this creed. You'll notice, too, that this is something you only pray uh, either on solemnities or on Sundays or on holy days of obligation. If you go to a daily Mass in the morning, for instance, on any given day in ordinary time, normally this isn't a part of, of, that, uh, of that service. Okay? So the creed is, is in the Mass when it's a Sunday or a solemnity or a holy day of obligation. Okay, so... I'll give you a little history before we start. So a lot of people take, you take for granted when you recite the creed what you're saying. Most people just recite it because it's something that they have been used to talking or used to reciting every time they've gone to church. Even some non-Catholic churches, Protestant churches, uh, use this creed. Uh, but uh, the creed is actually something that took a lot of time and a lot of people's lives to get. So the first council in the church, and a council in the church was a meeting where the bishops got together and talked about an issue that they hadn't resolved before, at least not officially. So the very first council, uh, you might know if, you've, if you're familiar with scripture, took place in Jerusalem, uh, and it was regarding circumcision. It was regarding whether or not non-Jews who entered Christianity, who were baptized, had to be circumcised. And, and their conclusion was no. That was the first council. Then you had what was called the first ecumenical council. So when the church got big enough, which means it spread from Jerusalem to Antioch to Alexandria and Egypt to Rome uh, and now Italy, when the church got big enough, whenever they had a council, they started calling them ecumenical councils because the entire world church or universal church or Catholic church, as we call it now, was involved. So all of the bishops came, they were all called to try to decide or understand better the faith so that what was already believed could be more clarified. Because normally, normally heresies, and a heresy is a teaching that is opposed to the church, when a heresy becomes popular, a lot of times it's out of a confusion of something in scripture or of something that happened in church. I want you to imagine, if you will, if your entire education of your faith was just Sunday school. If you can imagine, that's kind of what the Christian church was like at this time. Everybody's knowledge of faith, other than people who had studied a lot, which was minimal at that point, was what they heard at church. And uh, it's interesting because at this point, 
uh, especially when you get to about the fourth century, uh, Christian beliefs were kind of like city gossip, whether or not they believed the new heresy or not. And when you read some of the texts of these ancient authors, you see that people were arguing in the streets. So it actually caused some, uh, if you want to call it, polemic city discussion. Right? So because it not only had to do with the church, at that time it also had to do with the empire. Okay. So ecumenical councils were important because they helped not only the church unify, but also the people. Uh, so, uh, if, if you can't imagine this, uh, I, I, I watched recently, and by recently I mean within a few months, uh, it was around the time a movie came out, The, Tempta- the Last Temptations of Christ. Do you guys remember that movie that uh, Martin Scorsese made? And uh, Oprah actually did an episode uh, where she interviewed a Jesuit priest and a pro- Protestant minister, and there was an Orthodox priest, and uh, and, I, and, and if you watch this episode on YouTube, every single person in the audience was just outraged. They all had their own opinions. Uh, and frankly, that was a time when America was a lot more religious than it is now. And I remember watching it thinking, this actually is exactly probably what uh, Nicaea was like during the first council. And that's kind of how my nerd mind works. Uh, when I watch TV, I think how it relates to uh, councils that happened 1,700 years ago. But... Uh, So that's the kind of dynamic. So the creed is something that evolved over almost the first 1,000 years of the church's life. So the first council dealt with whether or not Jesus was in fact God. It was as simple as that. So as ecumenical councils kept happening, because there were certainly more than one, Every one of those councils helped organize and define what you pray on Sunday. So what you pray on Sunday evolved out of about 800 years worth of bishops and popes meeting and talking and discussing and arguing over who is God the Father, who is God the Son, and who is the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so that's why, if you notice here, that's actually divided by person. So when you recite the creed, you're reciting your faith in God as Father, in God as Son, and as God as Holy Spirit. Because the last thing that Jesus told the apostles when he ascended into heaven was baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, And so you have there and then at his baptism a, a theophany of the Trinity. Okay, are you guys following? Everything good so far? Good. Okay. So, uh, what I'd like to do is just break this down, and I'll I'll go over each paragraph with you, and hopefully uh, we can get it all done in time. If you have a question, uh, I would ask that you leave it at the end, only because uh, this is an intense thing, and I only have an hour. What is, does Father normally do that? Does he, if you have questions, do you just raise your hand, or does he let you wait? Okay. Well, if you don't mind for me, for my sake, do you mind if we wait? So if we look at the first, we'll just read it together. Let's just read the first paragraph together. It's only four lines. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Okay. So there is, so when the creed was written, it's actually written in two languages, Latin and Greek. Uh, Your tradition, the Latin tradition, the first word of the creed is credo which means I believe. Uh, In the Greek, uh, it's uh, blepomos, which means we believe. Okay, so you have uh, have two ways to understand this. The first way is I believe, which means that the church is a single body. So there's two things. So you're actually saying I personally believe, but when you recite the creed, you're standing for the whole church as a single body. And so you're saying the whole church as one body believes in God, the Father, the Almighty. When you say we believe, if, if some people use that translation, you're referring to God, uh, to, to the people of the church, the body of Christ and all of its members. So the first thing we say we believe in is one God. Okay, this, this is very much rooted in the Old Testament. Okay, because God, according to the people of Israel, is one, right? And that was kind of the defining aspect of who God was for them. And that was what was confusing for a lot of other nations that surrounded them about who God was. Because most other nations had multiple gods. 
and they would offer offerings to different gods for different purposes. If you wanted to win a battle, you offered to the god of war. If you wanted uh, to fall in love, you offered to the god of love. If you wanted uh, a good fortune, you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the first things that God reveals himself, especially, uh, especially to Moses, for instance, at the burning bush, is I am who am. I just am. I am I'm the only one up here. <laughs> okay? So you're saying, I believe in one God. You're reaffirming a faith that has actually been in existence for nearly 5,000 years, 4,000 years, give or take. You're, you're, you're reciting the same faith of Abraham. The Father, the Almighty. So the word Father, Father gets a little bit more into the New Testament understanding of who God is. Father is not something that appears so much in the Old Testament. It does appear because God's mercy in the Psalms uh, is, is compared to a mother's womb and a father's compassion. But God is never called Father in the way that Jesus calls Father, God Father, when he teaches us the Our Father. So what's unique to the Christian faith is God is no longer this being in the sky that gets angry or happy or sad or whatever. God is related to us through Jesus Christ in, in terms of how St. Paul puts it, by virtue of our baptism, we become co-heirs uh, in sonship because of Christ. And because of that, we become heirs to the Father. So we have a real spiritual relationship, and we can call God Father. And the next word, Almighty. So it's good that these words are attached. Because if God were Almighty, but He weren't a loving Father, uh, He would be terrifying. Right? He'd be, he'd be scary. Uh, he would be kind of a mean guy in heaven that, that has power, that can just use it at his will in whatever way he wants. But you're calling God an almighty father, right? You're calling the God of the Bible, which is a compassionate father, he's almighty, which means uh, omnipotent is another good word, right? He has every power, so there's nothing that could keep in check his mercy, right? His, his role as loving, loving father is not, there's no boundary that that can contain. Okay? So we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, mighty, maker of heaven and earth. Maker of heaven and earth is a really important thing because that, in the Bible, that's actually the first description that we have of God. The first chapter of Genesis, God is revealed as a creator. Okay? The very, very first chapter of Genesis before anything else happens, which is kind of a, a mythical, poetic way of reciting how the world came to be. It's not really written to be a scientific account. It's written to be more, of, um, more like the other accounts during its time were, which is a mythical way to describe the relationship between God and creation. And the way God is uh, it's described as creator. So you know at least one thing for that, from that story for sure. There is a creation. It's not God. God is God. Okay? There's another thing that comes from that story and that the, the author orders creation. A lot of other mythical stories about creation in the ancient world, God creates out of utter chaos. Right? If you look at Greek mythology, sometimes, I don't know if you remember studying that in high school, it's even hard to keep in mind what each God did and where they were and who they're... It's chaos. Right? So the God of the Old Testament is a God of order, right? And gods in other mythical accounts, when they make human beings, human beings are, their, are God's slave. In the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, when God makes man and woman, we're made in his image, okay? We actually are like God. He puts part of him in us. So to a certain extent, we share something in common with him. And that's what he says in the, when Jesus says, I call you friends because a friend is someone who knows the other. Okay, so God makes us capable of friendship with him. That's pretty incredible, right? And then the last thing, all things visible and invisible. So this gets into the realm, too, that there, there is a world, all right, that you can't see. First and foremost, the God that we've been talking about because you can't see him, touch him, feel him, hear him, Right? outside of miraculous occurrences. So you have God, uh, and, and then again, um, you have his angels. And, and as Christians, we know his saints. 
But in the biblical understanding prior to the New Testament, the invisible world referred to God and his angels uh, and Satan. But God, his angels, and Satan. So there is a spiritual dimension to the world and a physical dimension to the world. And as Christians, we believe that there is spiritual warfare, right? We believe that there is evil and good in this world that is at constant war with, with each other, okay? We have kind of an ironic knowledge of the conclusion. We know how it's going to end, but it's our choice which side of the, of the field we want to play on. So I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Are we good so far? Everybody understand? Okay, now let's get, so you see the second paragraph, so we've just finished a little synopsis of the first person of the Trinity, God, the Father. So now we're going to look at the second part, the second person of the Trinity, who uh, is made man, and as we know him, Jesus Christ. So this, the first person of the Trinity is God the Father, the second person of the Trinity is God the Son. As we know from John's Gospel, the Word became flesh, so the Word is another way of calling, uh, speaking of God's Son in the, in the Trinitarian sense. So that person enters into the world, and the New Testament actually says, a lot of times it says, um, uh, and God became flesh and dwelt among us, right? But the word in Greek is actually he pitched his tent among us. And the relation in the Bible with the Old Testament is that when the Jews in Egypt were given the law by Moses, the most important thing they're given at the end, other than the Ten Commandments, are the rules on how to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And that was in a tent. So there's a relationship in John's Gospel and the idea of God's presence dwelling with the Israelites in Egypt in the desert while they were on their way to the Holy Land. Uh, except for the, the tent, uh, to a certain extent, in, John, or in the Gospels, is Mary's womb, and then eventually Jerusalem, and then um, wherever he traveled. So the world became his tent. So I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. So uh, the word Lord um, uh, is, it, it's kurios in Greek, so when you call God Lord, uh, you're, you're referring to him as, as the God of, of Israel. Okay? The only begotten Son of God. Okay, these are, these, are, these are, I think, getting into the words that you say, but we might not understand. So, my dad and my mother um, were my, in a certain sense you might say they caused me to be. Probably every sense you would say they caused me to be. Okay? Uh, and so far, I've been happy about that. Uh, so when you say that, that the second person of the Trinity was begotten, it's different than to say that my father and my mother uh, gave, you know, gave life to me. Why? Because my dad at one point and my mom at one point didn't know each other. Okay? So I, I, at that point, I wasn't even close to existing. All right? When you say that... The Son was begotten by the Father. It's a little tricky, and it's maybe a little philosophically complicated. But if you think of the word begotten, it's not the same as the word to give birth. That's different. The idea that the authors had in mind is that if God is eternal, which means he's outside of time, which means there was never a moment where he wasn't, there was never a moment where he will be, he just is. He just is. It's, it's a little confusing because we're, we can't help but think in terms of time. Okay. So God is a trinity, right? As God the Father is eternal, the Son that he begets is also eternal. They're coexisting eternal realities with one another. So when you talk about the Son being begotten, right, the second person of the trinity didn't come into existence when Jesus was born. That's when the second person of the Trinity took on flesh. But when you say he was the only begotten son of the Father, you mean that this person, in a manner that we really can't understand, eternally exists with God the Father because God the Father is eternal. So there are two persons 
but one God. That's as clear as I can make it, <laughs> because it really is a mystery. So if you ask me, I don't understand, I will reply, me neither. <laughs> at least, at least, you know, you're not alone. Okay, but that, hopefully that makes more sense. That's what the word begotten means. So, uh, born of the Father before all ages. So that, again, explains more. When you say born of the Father before all ages, you're talking about the fact that born is used um, analogously, but the idea that it's before all ages means it's outside of time. It's eternal, like I was just saying. So, God from God, light from light. So, this is a really cool image the creed is giving you. So, if you want to think of the way, for instance, that the Father and the Son coexist eternally, if you shine a flashlight on a mirror and then you look at the ray coming off of the mirror, you would say that the image going into the mirror and that's reflecting off kind of exists, co 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 excuse me, coexist, right? As soon as I turn the flashlight off, the other ray goes away as well, okay? Th that's a clever analogy that it's getting. Or another way is if you put a mirror in front of a mirror, you're just going to get an infinite regress of mirrors. Every time I used to do that as a kid, it was a sign that I was going to study philosophy because I would just look and I would go, I'm looking at infinity. This is amazing. And I would just, just way weirder of a kid than anybody else. Around. So, uh, but anyways, that's the idea. You have kind of this weird kind of uh, ability to see uh, coexisting two things at once that are bound together but are, in God's sense, eternal. Does that make sense? So that's why the, the, the creed authors are giving you kind of a clever human analogy to try to make sense of what he's just said. Begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. So again, emphasizing this idea that, that the Son is the same God as God the Father. They exist as one substance, but as distinct persons that coexist with one another eternally. Like a ray hitting a mirror. You have a question? Oh, okay. Uh, through him all things were made. Okay, so that just reiterates what we said at the, uh, at the beginning. Um, so, God, we know God creates. Uh, it's in John's gospel that you have a little bit of a clarification of what happened in Genesis. So in Genesis, we know at the beginning there was a void, right? A, uh, set a void, uh, a wasteland, and God creates by breathing his spirit in John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with him, and through him all things were made. So it's through the Word that God's Spirit proceeds, right? So creation, according to John, something we don't really get in Genesis, was an act of the entire Trinity. It wasn't just God the Father you know, doing something, and then he walks back home and says to the Son and the Spirit, man, I had a really great day. I made all this stuff. No, that's not how it happens. So they're one body, they're, excuse me, they're one substance, and so creation has to do with all of their persons. But the through, the person that the gospel author is talking about creation happening through is God the Son, right? Uh... Okay, for us and now. So we've talked about, so far, the, the creed, according to the second person, has talked about everything eternal, like who God is outside of us. Now, he's about, now the creed's about to talk about what the, Holy, what the Son of God is going to do for us. How does he relate to us once he gets to our world? For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the power of the Holy Spirit he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Okay, so this is kind of the miraculous in between everything we've talked about in the creed so far, right? Everything we've done has been basically about God as an eternal being who at least right now we know is at least two persons. There's another guy coming, but we're not there yet. Uh, and now the creed is bringing you kind of the, the clincher Right, where that God humbles himself to enter into this world and not only become man, but become man through a 15, 14-year-old virgin. Right. Uh, and the word incarnate is used. So that word comes from a Latin word, incarnate, which 
you know, we get the word carnivore uh, and meat eater. So it literally means God became enfleshed. He entered into flesh and became man. Okay, so I want you to note, too, there are just a few people that the, the creed mentions other than the persons in the Trinity. So number one, the first one is Mary. That's kind of an indication that she's probably a big deal. Okay? I don't know if you've talked about her much, but she's uh, an important figure to Catholics. That's an indication that she's a big deal because in this creed, if you can imagine the people that were writing this sat down and thought, okay, how are we going to summarize Christianity for everyone who ever enters this faith for as long as it exists? It's kind of like thinking of the founding fathers when they thought, how are we going to form a, a, gov- a reality of government that will work in a way that will get away from the problems that we were facing in England before we came here? And how is that going to work for generations to come as long as people live in this country? Right? Brilliant, when I think of that kind of conversation. Well, that's what these church council fathers are kind of thinking like. Right? So if they put someone in here, that's a big deal. That means that they wanted, for all the Christians that are going to come after this, to narrow in on those people because they had a pretty important part to play in Jesus' life, for good or for bad. doesn't necessarily mean it's a good person, but it means that they're important. So the first person is Mary, and she is described uh, as virgin, right? And the reason that's important is because there's a prophecy in Isaiah that talks about a virgin giving birth to a son, right? So there's an indication that there's a fulfillment of a prophecy that, that was well known to the Jews. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, this is where I get, remember, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good people, but Pontius Pilate uh, was, a, was an official in the, Roman, in the Roman world, and in his lifetime, he was in charge of the Jerusalem area. Right? So he was kind of like what you would think of as a governor or a mayor of a town. And he had to report to people higher than him. The highest would have been the emperor, for us, the president. Okay, so his job, especially at that time, because there were a lot of zealots in Jerusalem, his job was to maintain order. Okay? And the reason it's important to think of him is because he's also someone that's, that's not just mentioned in the Bible, because he's, he's a historical figure. Right? And it was under his rule that the person that the, the fathers of this creed are concerned with suffered under, Pontius Pilate. So crucified. Now, crucifixion, I'll, I'll describe that a little bit. Crucifixion was a form of punishment used by Romans um, for a specific purpose, namely to prevent whatever crime this person committed. So let's say you stole and they crucified you for it. What they would do is not only would they crucify you, but they would put above your cross a sign that said your crime, thievery. And the idea is people would see it and think, I'm not going to be doing that this weekend, right? The idea was if if I do that, this is how I'm going to end up. And that's how the Romans did their business. You didn't mess with them. So crucifixion was also pretty brutal. It was so brutal that... There's really no one way to figure out how someone died from it because it happened in so many different ways that the, it, to try to figure out how it happened or how someone would die, how, how, if you try to think of a single way that everyone would die from it, it'd be like saying, well, if, if, if you got run over by a car, what was the exact cause of death? You'd think, well, he got hit by a car. I mean, right? It was that, it was just brutal. So... Uh, so again, it's, it's really up on preventive measures, which means for, uh, for Jesus' death, what was put on the top of the cross? The reason that Pontius Pilate officially crucified Jesus was because, not he called himself, but because he was the king of the Jews. And that's what ticked off the, the Pharisees at the time, because they didn't want his punishment to be literally that he was the king of the Jews, but that he called himself the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, I've written what I've written. You don't mess with me. I'm Roman, you're Jewish. Okay, that, and that's just how the Romans were. 
Okay, so he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day. So Jesus' death is pretty well recorded. In fact, there's no other crucifixion account that's nearly as descriptive as his. Not even close. Uh, so most people, atheists, religious, whatever, most people accept that Jesus was a person that lived in history and that was crucified by the Romans. The resurrection, accepting that, is what makes you a Christian. And St. Paul says, if Christ did not raise from the, rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. Right? So the, the resurrection, it's, it's funny. I know in my life, it's actually something I forget about often. I'm really good at remembering the crucifixion. Kind of makes me worried about how I think in general. But I'm really bad about remembering, oh yeah, he rose after that. Right? I don't know if you have that problem too. I'm really good at looking at a cross and thinking, oh my God, thank you for dying for me. I almost hardly remember, save on maybe Easter Day, the fact that three days later he rose from the dead. Okay. Uh, and that that gave a rise to a social dynamic that was kind of out of this world. All of a sudden, within a few hundred years, monasteries started popping up. People became celibate for the rest of their life. I mean, that to the Jews was... Not completely novel, but more, certainly more novel than it was uh, not novel. Right? We have a little bit of evidence that we're small communities of celibates, but uh, certainly not in the way that Jesus actually called for people to become celibate for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and aside from that, you have the, the apostles literally going to the ends of the world to preach. And what Paul says when he says, you know, Without the, the resurrection, our faith is in vain, is why in the world would 12 guys, 11 of whom preach to their martyrdom, do that if it was just about someone who came and died and then that was it? That's really not something worth your life. Right? It's really not. It would almost seem that the Messiah came and then, oh man, I wish God had had a better plan because the Romans killed him. So we have to remember that the resurrection is the chief, uh, the chief mystery in our faith, right? The highest feast. In fact, the first feast day in the history of the church's calendar was Easter. They, they used to just celebrate it, I think, every month. And then eventually the calendar grew and it became a year-long calendar. And then as that evolved, it became, we now have different cycles. Every three years we do something, we, there's an A, B, C calendar, so... But Easter, the, the mystery of Christ's resurrection, in fact, the whole reason you go to Mass on Sunday is because the Christian fathers start changed the Sabbath day, right? Which was, for the Jews, unheard of. That was the, most, that was the holiest day of the week. It was the day God rested. So his resurrection is a monumental and a pretty significant aspect of the faith. Nothing, there's nothing that we celebrate that's more important, Okay. And the idea in the Christian life is kind of a continuous death so that you can rise with him uh, again. Right. So, Pontius Pilate, third day. Okay, according to the scriptures. So that, I forgot that part. It's in the Bible. Okay. Uh, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Okay. So, the ascension is in the beginning of, of the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. What does it mean that he's on the right hand of the Father? Okay. God has a couple of lazy boys in heaven. The right one has a bigger cup holder. No, that's not what it means. So the, the right hand, first of all, hand in Hebrew, yod, uh, is the same word as the word for power. Uh, and there's a, in a lot of ancient cultures, there's a difference between your left hand and your right hand. In Latin, even, your left hand is called your sinister, your, your evil hand, right? Because most people are right-handed, okay? So your right hand in the Bible was a symbol of authority and power, right? So this is a symbolic way of talking about God the Son being given all of the authority in heaven when he ascends into heaven. Okay, so he, he's related to God's right-hand side as a symbolic way of speaking of the fact that the Father's power is also the Son's power. 
And the Son, who has become man and made friends with human beings, now can use that power to bring those people to God the Father. That's the whole, that's the entire point of the gospel. The Son bringing us to the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point. It's, it's like a, if you learn nothing else tonight, that's the, that's the point. Um, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is the part that makes for a really good movie, right? The end times. Uh, one of a big distinction between Catholics or Catholicism and Protestantism is we, we certainly have the book of Revelation. It's the one book that St. Thomas Aquinas, who is this really prolific theologian in the 16th cent- or 14th century, excuse me, wrote nothing about. He, d- he did not comment on the book of Revelation. He commented on the Gospels, on a lot of the Old Testament books. The book of Revelation is, in many ways, a giant mystery, right? To some degree, it explains a little bit more the Gospels. So, for instance, in chapter 12, you have this image of a woman giving birth to a son who fights a dragon, right? It's kind of a uh, celestial manner of talking about this war between good and evil and Jesus being born and fighting the devil. But there's a lot going on in Revelation that is very difficult to understand. You have another story of the churches, right, that were alive at the time, and Jesus says to some of the churches, you're doing well, you're not doing so well, right? But a lot of the story is, is a mystery, and so when you're talking about the end times, the one thing that Catholics do affirm that we believe is that Jesus will come a second time. Now, the first time he came for mercy, the, cro- the cross, the resurrection, all of that was done so that we could receive the sacramental life and be born again in the Spirit. The second time he comes, though, will be for justice, right? So the second time Jesus comes, when he comes again, it's going to be to judge the world, right? And that's all I know. If there's more, I, you're going to have to ask someone else. That's all I know. So maybe the best advice I can give you is, is to be ready. Um, and the sacrament of confessional, confession Sacrament of the Eucharist are a necessity in the, in the Catholic lifestyle, in Christian lifestyle, for that reason. Uh, okay, so person number three. So hopefully by this point you realize, like, wow, I, Father and the Son have never been so understandable. You're welcome. Now, um, so now the Holy Spirit, so the third person of the Trinity. This is the person often that we forget about the most, I think, uh, when you pray, I think people tend, when you pray to our Father, you're obviously referring to your Father. When you pray normally, I think we pray to Jesus. It's the third person of the Trinity that kind of gets left out, right? He's like the youngest brother, right? So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the, the, the Trinity, and he's also called Lord in this. And the reason was because there was also a heresy for a while that the Holy Spirit wasn't God. They had to have another council, they got together, and they said, yes, he is. Of course he is. So he's, he's, it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. So the Lord is also the word used to describe Jesus. So he's just as much Lord as Jesus is. No more, no less. Okay? Because he's one, there's just one God. Three persons, but just one God. They don't have, you know, cup holders with certain levels of God in them. They're all equally and uh, eternally God. So the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. So you have a similar description. I really don't want to get into what the word procession means because I'm not so sure I understand it perfectly. But the image is similar to that of when I talked about the Father and the Son, light from light. The Holy Spirit also proceeds from the Father and the Son eternally. So it's not as if, you know, day one, Father, day two, Son, day three, Spirit. God exists eternally as a trinity. The Father begets the Son, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So because the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal. Because the Father and the Son are eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Does that make sense? Am I good on time? I can't see your hand. Five minutes? Oh, okay, good, great. Okay, Uh, so I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. And this is the part when I said earlier, so a lot of times when we pray, 
we tend to only pray to God the Father or God the Son, and typically God the Son. But the reason it's important to remember the Holy Spirit is because that's who Jesus prays to, right? In chapter 17 of John's Gospel, Jesus, what's called the high priestly prayer, it's what Jesus prays before his passion. Uh, he prays to God the Father, so he, he says, he reiterates over and over, I want them to be one as we are one. But then he also asks for the Holy Spirit to come on the people that he loves. Right? And when he greets the apostles after the resurrection, he says, my peace, peace with you, my peace I give you, and then he breathes the Holy Spirit onto them. Right? And in fact, kind of a, a cool, tricky thing, the last word that Jesus said on the cross was what? Do you guys, anybody know? It is finished. It's finished. So, it is finished is an interesting way of speaking. So there's a relationship in the Bible between peace and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, my peace I give you, he breathes on them. Right? And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Right? And they have peace. When Jesus dies, he says, it is finished. Now, that's a tricky, it's a tricky thing to talk about because you have to remember that the New Testament was written in Greek. But it was written by Jews who spoke Greek. So it would kind of be like thinking of a book written in English about a Hispanic's life in America. Now, if that person's first language was Spanish, but they wrote the book in English to be read by Americans, they might be writing in English, but their mindset is not going to be American English. That's kind of how the New Testament is written. It's very Jewish. When you read the New Testament and then you read the Iliad or the Odyssey, those two things were written in Greek, but they are very different types of literature. Very different. I like to call the Bible, the Bible's more of a book of the gut, right? It's not so much a book of the head. It's definitely a book of the gut. Arabs and Jews, definitely people of the gut. Being one of them, people of the gut. Now, what does that mean? So when Jesus dies, he says, it is finished. And that word... Uh, in Greek is teleo, right? But the word in Hebrew is shalom, which means, literally means it has been given peace, right? So for something to finish in Hebrew means to, it, it gets to the point where there's peace, there's resolution, right? That's very different than the way we understand finish. When we think of finish, we mean movie's over, right? For them, when they meant finished, if two people are arguing, when they finish arguing, that means there's a resolution, hopefully. There's peace. There's shalom. So shalom is also the word Jews use even today to greet one another. So the last word Jesus used before he dies is peace. The first word he uses when he greets the apostles is peace. And that is always related to. And then what is, so he breathes on them when he rises. And what does it say? It, it is finished. And then breathing his last, he died. Okay, so... Shalom, peace, breath, and the Holy Spirit. So Holy, the Holy Spirit in the Bible is often related to peace. And the reason it's important to remember when we worship God to pray to the Holy Spirit uh, is because I find that when you pray only to God the Son, you're normally praying in activity. If you're the type of person that like prays on the way to work or prays while you're working, prays, when you pray to the Holy Spirit, you kind of have to stop. Uh, it, something about it, you don't, you kind of have to stop and just say, I need the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because peace is something that, as Jesus says, the world really can't offer. The world, it, it just can't. Not in the way that, not in the way the gospel offers it. Not, not that I've ever seen. And even though I'm young, I've seen a lot, for better or for worse. <laughs> right? So we pray to the Holy Spirit, we worship and glorify the Holy Spirit as God, to receive the kind of peace that Jesus gives on the cross and in his resurrection to the apostles. Uh, who with the Father and the Son has worked been glorified, and he has spoken through the prophets. So the Holy Spirit is someone who was alive in Abraham's time, in Isaac's time, in Jacob's time, in Moses' time, in David's time, in Elijah's time. And he was in act with all of those people. So if you imagine, remember, God is outside of time. So if you want to th- if you want something that will kind of blow your mind, at this very moment, the, the, the perception that God has of us in this room 
For God, at that same moment, he is talking to Abraham. Right? At that same moment, he's watching the angel Gabriel appear to Mary. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is alive in everyone that, was, that ever spoke of God and everyone that ever will. In a specific way, the prophets were the people who were given the task to foretell what was going to happen. And a lot of times there were people that were persecuted because they also tended to say what was wrong. And people don't like to hear what's wrong about their life. Mm -mm. No. In my experience, there's, if there's one topic people don't want to talk about, it's what's in their life that's wrong. And they'll, they'll almost stop at nothing to avoid it. Okay. Uh, and so, in fact, that's exactly why Jesus was persecuted. Partly because he had criticized the Pharisees. Partly because I think they knew they were out of a job if he got big. But partly because he criticized what was wrong in his own faith. Right? Uh, and when... So the Holy Spirit is someone, on one level, that brings peace. On another level, that peace sometimes can't come without a little chaos first, right? So if you ask the Holy Spirit into your life, that doesn't mean that you're just going to fall over with utter peace and joy. It also means that you're going to be like Job, that you're, you might have to go through hell to get to heaven, right? I hope it's okay that I said that. <laughs> so, so the Holy Spirit uh, is an important person to pray to, and, and you have to pray with a lack of fear of what's going to happen if you let him in. All right, so uh, who has spoken to the prophets? I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So these are called the four marks of the church, right? Four marks of the church. Have you guys talked about that at all? Okay, so the four marks of the church are the four, those, that's a way of describing, those are four things that fittingly describe the Catholic church. Okay, so one holy Catholic apostolic. So one. Uh, the reason the church is one is because God is one. And the church is the body of Christ. It's kind of an image of what man should be like, an image of God, right? So it, it's one. It's, most, it's, most, it's best itself when it is more unified. That's why Christ said, I desire for them to be one just as we are one. So we should also be praying for the unity of the church, unity of Catholics and Protestants, unity of Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians, and in my, my opinion, too, a very strong union uh, of the Jewish people to the Christian faith, right? Unity. Okay, so when you, you know, when you see on TV, you know, Protestants and Catholics fighting in Ireland, Arabs and Jews fighting in the Middle East, you know, that, that's all coming from the devil. The devil wants you to think that the world is more divided than it is because you will believe that it can't be unified. Right? So God desires that all people, doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter, those things are superfluous to him, be unified. Okay? So the church is one. And we're unified primarily by the power of the Holy Spirit and by our faith. Okay? So we're mystically united in the sense that I'm, my baptism which happened 30, how old am I? 33 years ago, is the same baptism that you received if, you are, if some of you are baptized. And that means that I, I participate in Jesus the same amount that you do. It, I mean, if the priest pours more water, it doesn't mean you get more baptized. Right? And I was dunked, so I was, it was full. I was head to toe. Okay. So, one. Now, holy, this is a, a very interesting word. Holy is a word that can mean a lot of different things. In Hebrew, normally f holiness is related to fire, burning. The seraphim are angels that are crying, holy, 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 and they're on fire in heaven. So something that's holy is something that is, in the, in the Old Testament, it's on fire, but it's not consumed. So like the burning bush, it's on fire, but the bush itself is still in existence. So God consumes in a certain sense, but he doesn't destroy what he enters. And the first thing he says to Moses is, take off your sandals because you're on holy ground. So the, the other aspect of holiness is it's something reserved for God. It's separated. 
Okay? So you would think of maybe even this building. This is a holy building because when you walk into this church, you're, going, you're coming into this building to do something that you don't do in other buildings, at least not in the same way. You might call it Father. Father John has a state of holiness because his life is ordained for a purpose that isn't earthly. It's, it's ordained for a very distinct reason. Okay, so the, the word holy literally means unearthly, reserved for God. So the church is an institution that is meant for a very different purpose than Habitat for Humanity, right? Or a public library. Those are good things. They have good, noble purposes. Uh, but they're not disposed to giving eternal life. Okay, so even when the church is involved in charitable work and things like that, that's good. But the church can never become just another charitable organization. We're Christians because we feed the hungry. And during Christmas, we put up a tree with little things on it so we can get other people gifts. The main purpose of the church, if you want to be blunt, is to wage war against sin. When you get to the nitty gritty of your life, the good and the bad, the, the main purpose of the church is to root out sin from our lives so that we can have joy to its fullest, as Jesus said, and get to heaven. Uh, Catholic. Okay, so this, this word literally just means universal. Most of you probably know that. Uh, and, and I have been said, I remember I had a, my first Greek teacher told me the word Catholic wasn't in the Bible. And I, I, and I didn't know then because I didn't know much Greek, but I can tell him now, yes, it is. Because it, it literally just means universal, and it normally just gets translated as universal. Because the idea uh, for the early church, when you talked about it being universal, was that it was the unified reality of different churches, so one in Alexandria, one in Antioch, one in Rome, one in Jerusalem, but all of their faith was the same. They shared the common faith. Uh, the papacy that we have now wasn't as perfectly defined then. Uh, it was certainly present, but it wasn't as defined. Right? It, it doesn't become perfectly defined later. So back then, uh, you didn't even have the word pope. Right? The word for the role of Peter was kepha, it was rock. It was called the rock. Right. So, but the idea of the church being Catholic means that it's the uni unified uh, members, those members being all of the major churches of the time. So the way we would see it now is the, the Catholic church is the unified body of all of the different apostolic traditions that have unity to the Holy Father in Rome. Okay. And apostolic so this word, so the word apostle means uh, to follow. Okay, so the word apostle in, th in this text means that the church comes from a lineage starting from the, the first 12 apostles. Well, at least the first 11, right? Because Judas uh, left, he, he denied Christ, and then he killed himself. Then you had him replaced by Matthias, and then you have a 13th apostle, St. Paul. And so those, those people, then, when they went to different towns to start the church, they would ordain men either to take on the episcopacy, being the bishop of that region, or to take on priesthood, which means you work for the bishop, or to become a deacon, which meant that you were a servant to the priest. Uh, but the idea is that the apostolic sense is that all of the faith, all of those ordinations sprung from those first 13 people whose jobs it was to go into the world and start the church by doing this. It's almost amazing that it actually worked, right? 13 Jews from Jerusalem who went, I mean, we have tablets in China that are pretty old, giving testimony to Christianity in the eastern part of the world far before. I mean, we, I mean, we have evidence of it getting to India, right? Certainly, obviously, evidence of it giving to Europe. So the idea that it's apostolic is first the belief that the, the apostles had a special role in the gospel, and they certainly do. There's a big difference between the role the apostles have and the rest of the disciples have. So Jesus gives the disciples power to cast out demons, but there's some things that he only tells the apostles. Number one, he only tells the apostles, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. 
take, drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, which will be poured out for you and for the, the world for the forgiveness of sins. Do, the remem- do this in remembrance of me. He only tells the apostles how to celebrate the sacraments. And for instance, when he does that, when he brings up a covenant, the covenant that he's making, those are big words. To say this is the covenant I'm making, the only person that said that before him was Moses. Right? Those are big words. So the fact that he only has the apostles around him indicates that he's teaching them specifically how he wants the covenant he's establishing to work. Right? And the first thing he does when he does that, when he talks about the covenant, that's the only time that I'm aware of at this moment that he actually talks about the word covenant is at the first mass. And then he gives them the power to forgive sins. So when he's ascending into heaven, he says, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. So he kind of gives them the power not only to say mass, but also the church then has the authority, the church being these 12 guys, to forgive sins. That, in a summary, that's what the church's job is to do, is to make sure sins get forgiven so that people aren't weighed down by them when they die. Okay, so the church is one, the church is holy, the church is Catholic, the church is apostolic. Uh, And I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So in 1 Peter, so for some of you that come from Protestant denominations, especially if you come from a denomination, so, you know, Protestantism now is almost nothing like it was when it started. But um, one of the few sacraments that Luther kept was baptism. Uh, As reformers started coming out, They moved further and further away from the tradition. So eventually baptism was set aside uh, and you only had to say, you know, Jesus is my Lord and Savior and I accept him. Uh, But 1 Peter says literally, baptism is what saves you now. And he's contrasting it from circumcision. Because he's saying that it's not the covenant of Moses, but the covenant that this guy Jesus told me about, that's the covenant that's going to save your soul. So baptism... Because there's one God, because there's one Lord, there's also one church, there's only one baptism. And that's the baptism of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? Who are one God. And so when you enter into that baptism, the whole purpose of that first sacrament is the forgiveness of sins. When you go to confession, what really happens, when you think of confession, you only think, okay, I'm a little dark, I need to go to confession so I can get white again. You know, I can clean myself. You think of your soul as like a little sinner bubble that gets dark when there's sin. And, 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 uh, but baptism, the idea of confession, is actually going back to the state that, that you were in when, when you were baptized into the church. Okay? So it's in a certain way, it's, it's just making you exactly what you were at the beginning. Uh, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So this is the last part. So the resurrection of the dead, like I said earlier, we believe that Jesus is going to come again. Uh, And when that happens, the resurrection of the dead means that we'll be, so those that are past right now are in heaven, but they have not been reunited uh, to their bodies. And this, this belief is actually not just Christian. This is a very ancient Jewish belief, the idea of the resurrection of the dead. You see it in the book of Ezekiel, right, where the prophet watched kind of a prophetic way of seeing what was going to happen. He saw bones rise up, right, and, and take life and, and be again in flesh. And so the idea of the resurrection of the dead is united with the Jesus coming again. But it's important to understand why is it important to believe in the resurrection of the dead? Because you are not, right now, you are not yourself if you are just a soul. The body is, a, is essential to what it means to be human. And you're more like Christ with it, because he has one, right? So the fact that God became man also is a testament to the fact that the physical world is not evil. It's not the world in the, in the sense of the world being itself that is evil, right? Evil came from man's decision to abandon God's will. So the resurrection of the body is an affirmation that our bodies are good, and when rightly ordered and used for good, they glorify God. So the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. So another way to translate that is, is for eternal life. Okay, that we don't, as Christians, we don't live for this, this world. 
right? The, the church is one, it's holy, it's Catholic, it's apostolic. Uh, and the beauty of the church, really when we say this creed, is this creed is the same creed that's professed in Europe, the same that's professed in Africa. In fact, Africa, the most, m- most of the Catholics in the world are Africans, right? It's professed in the Middle East, it's professed in Asia, Asian countries. So when we profess the Nicene Creed, we're uniting ourselves to all the people around the world that believe the same things we do. Okay, uh, and working uh, at Sacred Heart, one of the cool things that I really enjoy is I have a fairly uh, multicultured classroom. I, I have one class where I have, uh, if you were to count the languages that can be spoken in the classroom, there's German, Chinese, Spanish, and Vietnamese in one classroom of maybe 12 people. And what's so neat about the Catholic faith is all of those people, you know, have their own backgrounds, they have their own families, and that we're different, right? And it's, it's, it's in my opinion, stupid to say that we're not, because people are different. But as Christ said, the differences don't mean that there can't be union, because the Father is not the same as the Son. Right? He's not the same. He's different. Right? A, a man is not the same as a woman. They're different. But in God's mind, the unity of the church is actually made more one because of the differences. Right? Uh, and so, for instance, uh, I'll tell a quick story and then I'll end. When I was in grad school, uh, I, I, um, I come, so my father is a Palestinian. And they put me in a room, so I, I'm Catholic. They put me in a room with another Catholic who, is, uh, who has Jewish-Israeli roots. And they called our room the Peace Treaty. And, uh, and at first, I mean, we just fought endlessly every day. And I just thought, what is, this is terrible. And not only, uh, so a year ago, I was his best man at his wedding. And one of the things that we found, no matter how much we would argue, because we would all the time, and we still do all the time, uh, was that the, the intention of God, for instance, with the creed, uh, is that all people, no matter how different, become one. Uh, and I remember one conversation we had that really shook me. Uh, he, I was arguing with him, we were talking, and he said, you know, Alex, I don't think you've ever thought of things from my point of view. And I asked, so you don't know what you're talking about. You and then I thought, you're right. I've never really thought, what is life from this guy's perspective? And then I thought, okay, how is he thinking? Where is he coming from? And the reason I bring that story up is because the creed, when we talk about the church being Catholic, it's very easy to just become Catholic exactly where we are um, and not really be able to be Catholic in the sense of thinking of Catholics that are around the world that are suffering. I, have a, I know someone right now who's... Um, his faith might mean his death, right? Uh, When we pray the Nicene Creed at Mass, it's important that we remember that there are members of the church who live very different lives than us, right? From simple things that honestly cause a lot of fighting, like cooking and cleaning, to ways, uh, their social lives, to the way they were educated. Uh, And the faith, you know, we, we kind of take for granted that your faith, you're not really risking nearly as much as other people are in the sense of your, like, you're not, I hope, at least I hope to God, none of you are worried for your lives coming here tonight, right? Um, So when you pray the Nicene Creed, it's important to remember to pray for people worldwide that uh, are dying for this creed. And with that, I think I'm done. So thank you. Uh, Are there any questions? Okay, good. Perfect. Good. There, um, I was going to say, if you'd like to leave a tip just in the back, I'll put a basket. It will go, 100% of the proceeds will go straight to me. And, uh, but no, thank you for having me. I enjoyed this a lot. Yes. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Alex. Um,
One of my favorite parts of my job, and this is each weekday, um, is our lunch break. So let me tell you about my lunch break. Our lunch break, we get to sit down. This, I've never worked in a setting quite like this, but we sit down with Father, and as a staff, we fellowship, we visit, we talk about the things that are on our heart. Um, but I always come away from our lunch break um, feeling fulfilled, whether or not I eat or not. So I learn something, and I enjoy that time. Alex, on a handful of occasions, has joined us for lunch. And I don't know if you can tell after this evening, but there is never a dull conversation between Father John and Alex. And so, and I enjoy just sitting back and hearing this energetic exchange between the two of them. And so, and one, I think that's one of the things that's so important about our faith is to always, always want to learn, always want to grow, want to have that fellowship and that exchange with others. And that's what draws us together. So that's one of my favorite things about this program. So I'm very grateful, and he's not kidding when he says that. I very casually today said, would you like to share some of your insight? And he, sure. So, um, so I'm very grateful that he came and, and shared his insight and his energy and his enthusiasm for our faith and what, what we believe. Um, if you have questions, Father will be back next week. I'm just kidding. We'll try to help you. But we'll be in the narthex, um, and Father really will be ne back next week, so I look forward to seeing you all. And um, if, you are, um, if you have just joined and you are not getting any text or anything and you need help with that process of getting on that app, please let me know, and I'll, I'll help you through that in the back. Okay? And let's stand, please, together, and we will close with the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.